we all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. So uh, welcome to Tangled Like Wool, a roundtable discussion on gender, social, and digital inequalities. Uh, my name is Shohini, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm from Point of View, um, a civil society organization uh, working in the intersection of gender, sexuality, and technology in India. And I will be the moderator for today. Um, the session will explore the relationship uh, between digital inequality and social and economic inequality through the lens and lived experiences of gender, especially in the context of the COVID pandemic. Um, surfacing gender inequality as a key driver that results in gender inequality and vice versa as well. So hopefully by the session, we will also have a better, better understanding um, of the implications of this on policy and how to strengthen gender equal and rights affirming um, digital policies and internet governance systems. Uh, we have a wonderful group of panelists and I'm really uh, excited to get this conversation started. I'll go through um, just briefly how the session is structured. We have about, I think, 90 minutes. Uh, I will first go through the gender report card analysis, which um, is part of the, this dynamic coalition's aim uh, to look at how gender is integrated um, into IGF's discussion every year. Then we will have about an hour of discussion and uh, it would be great if participants could just, uh, if you have any discussion points or questions, you can use the chat feature. And for uh, those of us who are joining in person, um, I'm not sure how it would work, but just like uh, flag us and we'll include it, but we'll also have about 10 to 15 minutes for question and answer afterwards. So uh, really briefly, the gender report card is part of the dynamic coalition on gender and internet governance objectives to ensure that the discussions in IGF is peopled and articulated by uh, different genders, as well as to ensure that gendered perspectives, realities, and concerns inform the gender of internet governance. Um, while there are usually two components that we look at, which is you know, the representation um, in the IGF discussions, as well as the content, since last year it was fully online, um, getting an accurate uh, data on the participation was, um, it, the methodology, it would just wasn't strong enough and was challenging. So we will only be presenting the information on the content. So it's a very brief presentation, and then I, we can go into uh, a discussion on what today's session is uh, about. So I think I'll be able to share my screen. Um, just give me one second. Okay, I hope everyone can see this. So um, this, the gender report card is uh, looking at, it's analyzing the sessions of 2020 um, and looking at uh, what were the type of content that was really covered uh, in these sessions. Um, so uh, out of the 117 sessions that were there last year, uh, about 78 report cards were filled, which is uh, about 26% less from the year before. And from that, uh, when we're looking at the relevance of gender as a topic, only 10% sh showed that there was a direct engagement. Um, about 30% said that there was partial engagement and 27% uh, showed that there was no engagement at all, um, which is again, uh, less than the year previously. So direct engagement in uh, 2019 was higher. Uh, so there was a 14% decrease last year. 
partial engagement of gender in these sessions also decreased uh, from 41 to 34. So that was there was a 17 percent of decrease um, last year. So this is a very quick uh, summary, and we will have I think the report of this will be going up um, on the co uh, coalition's website. Um, so in, in a little bit, I'm not exactly sure when it will be going up, but yeah, it will be available there. But this kind of shows, uh, given these numbers, you know, we're really glad to have today's session um, to ensure that we are talking about uh, gender within internet governance. So I'll start off with, um, you know, our panelists, and if we can just uh, have them introduce themselves, that would be great, starting with uh, Mona. Hi, everybody. I'm happy to be joining you today. This is Mona Shtaye. I'm the Advocacy Advisor at Hamlet, the Arab Center for the Advancement of Social Media. I'm joining today from London, but we are based in Palestine and we are working there. Thanks. And we can go to Sadaf next. Hi, everyone. My name is Sadaf Khan. I'm the co-founder of Media Matters for Democracy and Managing Editor for Digital Rights Monitor, which is Pakistan's only um, digital news website focusing on internet governance and digital rights issues. And very happy to be here. Thanks. Um, then Avis. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, I don't know what happened to the camera, but you need, I need permission to have the, the camera. So, um, Let's say uh, I'm Avis Momeni from uh, Protege QV, civil society organization based in Yaoundé in Cameroon. So uh, I'm glad to, to be here and share our own experience with uh, participants. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Um, and I think we have a pretty small group. So actually we can maybe just get a round of introduction from everyone. Uh, maybe from the in-panel, uh, sorry, in-person uh, participants, I'm not really sure. And, and maybe panelists, I'm not sure who's there. So if we can get an introduction from there, that'd be great as well. Yeah, uh, Ponsole and I are both here. So hi, I'm Mallory Nodal um, from the Center for Democracy and Technology. Um, I'm based in Washington, but I'm here today in Katowice. Hi, I'm Pons Light, a Lulaji, based in, in, in the Gambia with Joko Labs Banjul and um, National Resource Person for the Gambian National IGF, and um, I'm present on site in, in um, Poland. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, are there any other participants or panelists uh, on site? We are only two, me and Mallory. Yeah. Great. Um, and then. I think if we can get like John and Riddhi to also introduce themselves, um, and then we can kind of dive straight into the discussion. Uh, John, if you can just get started. Or Riddhi, I guess that's okay as well. Hi, Rizier. I'm from Point of View. I'll be taking notes here today. Okay, and John, or we can, uh, I'm not sure if they can hear me. Okay, um, that's fine. I think we can just kind of dive in. It's just, it's us, it's a small group. So um, we can talk. I think it would be great to kind of start talking about um, the relationship between digital inequalities and social inequalities that exists um, in your in the region that you're working in uh, through a gendered lens, especially in the context of COVID. So how has this relationship been impacted, whether it's you know exacerbated it or changed it in some just uh, in some form. Um, and yeah, I, I just want to remind if we can keep it keep the comments to about three minutes and then we can get uh, a sort of discussion going on the basis of that. So anyone who wants to dive in, we can, please feel free to do so. I can start if that's okay. 
Um, so I'm from Pakistan and I'm not sure how many of the people present here are aware of the political um, you know, demographics in the country, but Pakistan is a pretty uh, conservative country in some ways. We have a pretty patriarchal tradition within our policy making and within our culture. Um, and when it comes to access to technology, unfortunately, even though we have great indicators with regards to access, we have one of the most affordable internets um, in the region, but, but when it comes to ownership of the mobile phone, for example, or access to internet, um, we also have the biggest gender digital divide in the region. Um, and what happened, like, obviously, this digital gender divide is not directly, not just maybe related to financial issues, affordability issues, accessibility issues, um, but it has very present and very stark social dimensions there. Um, so ownership of mobile phones, which in Pakistan is linked to, um, you know, your identity card, your national identity card, you, your, your mobile phone is again linked to your biometric data, et cetera. Um, and because of the nature of the society and because of the fact that women feel unsafe, um, giving data in public spaces, being in public spaces, um, oftentimes, even if a woman would be using a mobile phone or the internet, it would not be registered in her name. It would not be in, under her direct ownership. Um, but what happened during COVID is the fact that, you know, because it, in normal situations, even if you don't have ownership, it's fine. People within families, let's say, do divide the online time, et cetera. They manage to make it work. But during COVID, obviously, everybody was completely dependent on their devices, especially when it comes to education. Um, and households with single devices or even multiple devices prioritized uh, male students over female students. Uh, but this dynamic didn't stay within homes. In multiple regions across Pakistan, different organized, different public bodies put up public Wi-Fis, um, to which only boy and male students were allowed to access. And there were you know, obviously, this is a very discriminatory practice, um, but on ground, they had good justifications regarding protection and safety um, and, you know, safety issues, blah, 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 are were more, were more um, exasperated during COVID itself. So what A, women didn't have access within their homes, B, they didn't have access in public spaces, C, they were cut off from places where they actually did have access before, like educational institutes, places of employment, etc. Um, what I feel has resulted is over the last year, we have seen the internet in Pakistan become a very, very toxic place. And it was also always toxic, but the level of toxicity, the, but the level of um, patriarchal hate food commentary that has kind of spewed forward on the internet. Um, it has noticeably increased in the last two years. Um, resultantly, we have seen multiple campaigns, counter narratives starting organically without direct engagement from usual mobilizers and organizers. That to me is proof that situation, you know, it has actually worsened. It's not just as activists um, looking at the internet and thinking this is getting worse. It's actually getting worse. Um, on the, you know, uh, on the side of access to different facilities, health, food, um, shelter, police, law enforcement, etc. There is a complete lack of data. A number of government institutions, including the National Commission on the Status of Women Rights, um, they initiated discussions and discourses around data gathering, around data collection. But obviously, when women are unable to connect, they are unable to participate in online consultations, which was the way during this whole period. Um, so I feel that um, you know it's not you know the digital and social divides were obviously interconnected. But COVID has made it much worse, and the COVID and COVID has actually actually made our fight much more difficult, because the kind of hate that has been normalized over these couple of years, we have not seen that that kind of hate um, against women in such you know in with such intensity um, becoming so normalized. So uh, I'm sure there are similar examples in the region. I'm sure Pakistan can't be the only. You know, Pakistani women can't be the only one facing this extra dose of hatred and withdrawal, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, as you mentioned that it's, I'm sure it's not just happening in Pakistan. I mean, in India, we've seen uh, how this has gotten worse and the so social inequalities have kind of been ex exacerbated, but also I'm assuming in other regions as well, if 
um, the other panelists can speak to that as well. Yeah, maybe I can jump in. So uh, when we are talking about Palestine and the Arab region, I'll be like zoom in to Palestine because we are working there. Uh, there is uh, some kind of the gender-based violence that is targeting women and the other LGBTQ communities. We at Hamle have published a gender-based violence study in 2018, so it's a bit before the pandemic. And it was like during the pandemic, it was worse. Uh, the situation was worse. But before the pandemic, our study showed that one out of of three uh, women in Palestine are being exposed to gender-based violence in the online spaces. Like we are talking about bullying, harassment, and so on in the, gen in the online spaces. And one out of these three women uh, say, are leaving the internet because of this gender-based violence. Earlier this year, we also published a research about the hate speech on the, um, in the uh, social media platforms where we were asking people during the focus groups but also during the survey that uh, that was uh, surveyed like we surveyed around 1200 people about the basic or the main uh, hate speech on the uh, social media platforms they were focusing on the political uh, circumstances they were mentioning the israeli occupation but also the political split between west bank and gaza strip but they did not focus or they did not mention the hate speech against women on the social media platform, um, maybe that's a sign how people can see the gender-based violence or the hate speech. Maybe they, they can't see that the hate speech against women as a hate speech. Maybe there is some kind of reflection how people are classifying the hate speech. And we have observed, we have seen many of memes on the social media platforms during the two years of the pandemic, which really emphasized and it was stressing on the very traditional roles for women and their homes for the very traditional roles that they are they, they are supposed uh, by the patriarchal society to be doing. And this kind of content on the social media platforms is making a stereotyping is making labeling a woman and they are putting women in a specific places that they or they they are like they're supposed to be in and either in a good stereotyping in a good way or in a bad way quote unquote uh, stereotyping is stereotyping putting the strong woman as uh, like and giving the strong woman in the posters a very a uh, radical, let's say, look, or giving the uh, women who are exposed to violence a very traditional look, like more, most most of the memes that we are seeing, most of the web posters that we are seeing, that the women who are exposed to violence, mostly they are brown women, they are sometimes uh, putting hijab or something like that. This is kind of stereotyping of women on the social media platforms. We are seeing that during the Palestine Digital Activism Forum, which is an annual forum we at Hamle are organizing, and it will be held in, in, in May for the 2022. Uh, for the past year, we have uh, organized around table to talk about the stereotyping for women on social media platforms in the Arab region. Most of our speakers, all of our speakers, they were they were stressing that they, they have observed, they have documented this kind of stereotyping content for women in the social media during the pandemic. It was increased because most of the people were sitting at their homes and they were thinking that all this homework that usually women used to do so is we should like make extra label for women to continue doing so. So that kind of content on social media is also putting extra effort for us as a digital rights defenders to remove from women because we are not supposed to do that. That's very traditional thinking about women. The third thing that I would like to highlight when talking about the gender-based violence that specifically was exposed during the past two years we all know that during the since the pandemic had started government 
and regimes around the world, and specifically in the global South world, they were keen to normalize using surveillance technologies. They want to normalize that. They, they want people to accept that. And sometimes they want people to start demanding using these surveillance technologies under the pretext of saving or protecting public health. That happened. We've seen that and we've monitored that. But the unfortunate thing is this kind of surveillance, this kind of was like it was affecting women. Our last report about the CCTV cameras in East Jerusalem showed that we have we conducted we have conducted interviews with women in Jerusalem where they were uh, stressing that they can't take off their hijab inside their homes because they feel that they are surveilled inside their homes because of the CCTV cameras in Jerusalem, but also during a uh, June escalation. Um, following up on uh, killing the political opponent and activist Nizar Banat by the PA, when we took the streets asking justice for Nizar as a political activist, the PA was confiscating and stealing our phones. They were focusing on ladies, specifically ladies who are coming out of very uh, um, conservative backgrounds in order to put shame on these ladies. So after stealing our phones, they were sharing pictures, private pictures out of these phones on the social media platforms in order to intimidate women and prevent these women from taking the streets again, asking justice or, be, or, or, or even expressing ourselves. As a result of that, we see how women are having much more complicated issues on the social media platforms or in the digital spaces when it comes to, 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 to several topics like hate speech, gender-based violence, surveillance, and so on. And because of that, I'm, I'm glad we are here today so we can like share experience on what others do and what we at Hamle are doing to protect women and to think together what we are supposed to do uh, that. So that's for Palestine, but we definitely will continue and talk about the other things that that we did and also that we are planning to do in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Mona. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, we definitely want to get to where we talk about what are the types of strategies that are being used and what what which ones are effective and you know. Uh, rights affirming and which ones are not. So you've already touched upon some of that. And Can in I just our next- add, um, One, sorry, I-, I Yes, I, yes, please. I remember, yeah, we, something that, um, you know, Mona was saying, um, you know, the way she was describing these different elements of speech that happen online that are not traditionally considered violent, um, but do inflict violence on women. I think what we have seen in the last couple of years and the way the ethos on the internet has developed, we, there is a need to kind of re, um, rethink how we define violence against women online. So considering an environment that's not violent or hateful or insightful, maybe in a very direct manner, but promotes a culture, promotes the stereotypes, promotes the images um, that inflict violence on women in many different ways. Um, you know, that's something that we don't really think about in that nuance. And obviously, dealing with those needs a very different kind of strategy than dealing with, you know, direct incitement to violence or outward, um, you know, overt hate speech. So yeah, it's, it's very interesting to see that being brought up. This is something I've been thinking about a lot. Yeah, thanks for adding that, Sadaf. And I, I think um, when we're looking, when we're thinking through the implications or how uh, the 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 exasperation of social inequalities and digital inequalities during COVID uh, has highlighted certain things for us, uh, and what could be the potential policy implications? I think speech and what constitutes as violence against women. Um, online, that would be a very interesting thing to look at. Um, I want to just ask if Mallory or Ponsolet or Avis want to add things from the regions yes, or countries yes. that they're working in. Yeah, Mallory. Sure, yeah, I can, um, I can weigh in, although I'm going to speak less about sort of direct effects um, this, that Mana and um, others have said, which have been super fascinating. And I think 
they do they do factor in to the work that I'm I'm looking at. So I um, I'll start a bit back. So I'm uh, the chief technologist of the Center for Democracy and Technology. Um, I was I sort of started my career in this work as a staff member at the Association for Progressive Communications, which has obviously a really robust uh, women's program, and at that point understood a lot better um, sort of the intersectional feminist issues at play in internet governance. And um, in particular, my role right now is to engage in the technical community in standard in internet standards setting space. So it's very far removed from you know, sort of direct um, community engagement. At the same time though, I think that's the challenge that in my role as co-chair of the Human Rights Protocol Considerations Research Group of the Internet Research Task Force, I'm looking for areas of study or ways to bring in um, the voice of those most affected and from an intersectional feminist perspective. So that I think effectively always means I'm doing two things simultaneously. One is um, figuring out how to lower the barriers to broader participation from um, multi-stakeholder communities that involve women, um, diversity and gender, diversity and race, um, diversity and geopolitical location. Um, and that can happen through efforts like diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, I sort of spent 2018 to the present day actually trying to get um, a draft in the Internet Engineering Task Force through that talks about the use of language, um, the use of actually stopping the use of oppressive terms like uh, master, slave, blacklist, whitelist, that sort of thing. It's still not published, but that's a that's a different story. So that's the one track. The one track is sort of like lowering barriers, participation, getting more people involved. It's inviting speakers who have these perspectives to hopefully inspire, maybe influence the engineering that happens. And then this, the second track then is on figuring out what are the substantive issues that are overlapping um, in feminist, uh, intersectional feminist analysis and protocol development. So um, I think that there's more exploration needed in that latter piece. Um, I think this, this dynamic coalition is um, exactly the kind of community of practice that's needed more in other internet governance spaces to speak to that first piece around lowering barriers to entry and getting more participation. I actually think that the scorecard could be um, maybe replicated or shared with um, other bodies, other initiatives, other intergovernmental agencies and so on that come to the IGF um, that should maybe at the very least know that this scorecard and this dynamic coalition exist and maybe even pick up some of the methodology. Um, so I'd like, I'd be keen to actually explore that maybe as a future area of work. But then again, like on the substance, cause it's just the much harder one <laughs> for me anyway, when I think about, you know, what can we say about the ways that the internet is designed from the protocol, from the hardware to the, to the physical infrastructure, to the protocol and the application layer, what are those, um, design choices, what are those opportunities to improve the internet for, um, you know, folks that are most disadvantaged that don't have as much access, you know, I, we, we approach this problem similarly with the human rights framework in my, in my research group. Um, and we do have an RFC, an RFC is just a, an official publication of the Internet Engineering Task Force. We do have an RFC on um, human rights as a kind of standard in its own right, actually, um, standard for, you know, obviously respecting um, states' obligation to respect human rights, and then um, protocols as standards, and what are some of the areas of overlap there. So that RFC exists. I wanted to do the same thing, but instead of using the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I wanted to use the feminist principles of the internet, which um, have been developed over time from a bottom-up movement-led approach. Um, you know, APC was huge in that. I participated in some of it as a member or as a staff member at APC, and then now as a member and sort of ongoing work. Um, so going principle by principle, looking at what are the issue areas uncovered that might affect 
um, protocol design. It's not as easy a task as it sounds. There's not always a whole lot. So that will be sort of an ongoing effort, but if there are researchers out there or folks that are interested in solving this problem, we keep our research open on uh, GitHub and we meet three times a year as part of the Internet Engineering Task Force. So there's plenty of opportunities to come and, and work with us. Um, but then the another one that just came up recently, so this is actually just at the idea stage, but I think it's actually pretty interesting is that um, there's another research group called the Privacy Enhancement and Assessments Research Group that looks at, yeah, the, the right to privacy narrowly. But the reason I mention it is that there's a body of work in there that I'm currently um, responsible for on censorship methods. So this research document sort of just outlines every single conceivable way from a technical perspective, censors are able to, you know, block, filter, throttle content pretty technical. Um, based on that um, approach, and I think that would be useful if it ever um, gets finalized and published, is to, the idea was to actually take um, sort of spouseware, I, I don't know the, a better term for it, but you know, the sort of apps you can download, there's a huge market for this, you can download these apps on the phone, on your, on your, you know, intimate partner's phone, and then, you know, track her movements or read all of the texts or, you know, the, these apps are ubiquitous. I suspect that um, there are probably only, you know, a handful of uh, really robust app platforms that are responsible for most of the spouseware out there. And then all the other apps are just sort of copycats of those, those core you know, codes. So the idea is that we take all of those apps. Um, there's plenty of research out there, I imagine, that sort of breaks down how they work. Um, they test them for you know, sort of protocols they use. And then I think it would be useful to actually try to document in the same way that we documented the technical mechanisms for censorship, that we actually document what are the internet protocols that are being sort of exploited or abused or leveraged to um, track people online. Because I think one mistake that um, I see made quite often is that um, we, we trust the endpoints. Um, when we're designing secure protocols, we assume that like our home routers and our end devices are effectively um, good user agents. They're proxies for what we want. And that I don't think is true if you have um, spyware or spouseware on your phone. It's certainly not true if you have someone who's using the same Wi-Fi router who maybe has higher technical expertise than you that can um, leverage that power differential to spy and to track. So that's an, that's, I, there's not been a single word written on that research project. I'm giving you a peek into what we think might be a useful area of study um, that then could help, um, again, just uh, inspire, sort of shift the imagination and perspective of those who are um, designing internet protocols to understand maybe what are some of the challenges and threat models that they hadn't yet considered that are probably not um, usually brought up in um, engineering spaces that are so, there's such a heavy monoculture of, you know, sort of privileged Western white men that are mid to late career working on um, internet standards. So um, just wanted to share those um, perspectives and hopefully that is, you know, is interesting enough. I really appreciate hearing the stories of how um, affected communities really experience the suppression that's exacerbated by technology. And hopefully the theory of change, which is that if we can make you know, the way the internet works a little bit more secure for those most affected than everybody benefits from that. Um, and so I hope we can keep having that dialogue. Thanks very much. Thanks, thanks so much, Mallory. Um, before we move on to, uh, you know, uh, to, to Ponsalat and um, Avis, I just wanted to kind of ask that you, you, you are giving a very different perspective uh, from our first two, um, panelists. And I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, what, what can we, uh, you, you spoke about design, uh, and the way that the internet is designed, and you spoke about, uh, you know, apps and the, the technical kind of component of the internet. Um, so has COVID, like during the pandemic, have there been patterns that have emerged as a result of, uh, uh, of, of the pandemic, of, maybe increased usage of these technologies that uh, have highlighted really how 
uh, unequal or how uh, how much how much barriers or what type of barriers that exist already um, or is, is this just uh, you know kind of continuation of what's been there before and uh, COVID hasn't really like impacted as much or changed it as much if you can speak to that a little bit and then um we'll move on to the other panelists certainly yeah i'll do my best um i think that certainly usage has gone up um it has shown i think the technical community is really patting itself on the back because the internet held up and i wouldn't disagree i think that is true i think that a lot of that is due to centralization of services. So we've got some really big companies that were able to handle the load and that work together to balance it rather than, uh, I don't think, for example, we saw like a really robust, you know, totally decentralized internet, you know, contributing to that in all ways. I think we looked to um, reports out of ITU and ISOC for that sort of, you know, health of the internet and, and increase in access um, figures. But I think we, at the same time, shouldn't take those high level figures at face value. I think there must be some um, detail in that, right? Um, if maybe devices are not well distributed um, and that there's some gender dimension to the ways we have access to um, devices, then I think that does have an implication for the ways we design tools for remote education, um, for remote work. Um, we often imagine that, you know, people who are connected have one, at least one device. Some of us have more than one device, um, but there are many places where, you know, you've got children, you've got teenagers, you have, you um, elders, you have a variety of folks who may actually be using um, devices together. And um, so I don't know if enough has been done to really interrogate the differential use of, of devices and what that means for security and for privacy um, and for access. So that's another place where we could look. And I think that um, if we were to dig a bit deeper in it, COVID has given us um, a lot more data on that than I think we would have had otherwise. So that, I guess, is a silver lining. Thanks, Mallory. And maybe we can explore the, those aspects a little bit more when we talk about strategy and policy. Um, yeah, if you and I think Ponsolet was going to add to. OK, uh, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you, um, Mona Sadaf and Mallory. Um, I'm going to look at it from the perspective of um, living in a developing country and uh, the Gambia and what we have done recently in terms of um, gender inequalities that happened um, during the COVID and is still happening now. Um, I'll take the Gambia as a case in point of what we have done um, in terms of getting people to be more digitally um, included in programs, especially women. Uh, a good example um, I will start with, and then I will, we just had our um, presidential elections. There were more women voters that were registered um, than men out of the 950,000 plus um, voters that were registered. We had about 55% of them were women. That was impressive, but the, the sad fact of it is that a lot of the political parties were using social media to disseminate information. And we have in the Gambia whereby $5 is the cost for one gigabyte of data. So when you look at that, most of, this, uh, most of the women that were digitally excluded from not being well informed to be able to do their voting rights, which is their fundamental human rights, were because they couldn't afford data. So you have to think about affording data and feeding your family. So to be hearing all these messages of the, uh, uh, of the political parties, I know where to, so most of them relied on their husbands and stuff like that, or they came online um, 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 once, um, um, once in a while. So um, costs is a big issue, for, especially for um, disadvantaged women. Whereas we didn't have that problem with, um, young girls going to universities during the COVID, you know, because um, all the telco companies 
they made um, Google Classroom accessible for free on their, uh, um, for, for students in, 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 in the public university in the Gambia. So that was very good. But we'll, um, despite the fact we have um, for every home of the 2 million um, population, for every three homes, one person has a mobile phone. So the cost of mobile phones have been cheaper, but our um, affordability has been very expensive and has really excluded a lot of people. I'll give an example with a project we did earlier on in the year with um, rural um, women in the horticultural um, in, in industry in the North Bank region of, of the Gambia. And it was funded by the Association for Progressive Communication of which um, Joko Labs were a member uh, organization. And most of these women, they complained about how they have suffered to be able to access markets because everybody now was using WhatsApp to even just take a picture. And people will say, okay, these women are illiterate. How are they doing it? But they are using their children. So in carrying out that project um, and um, justifying our proposal to APC, we had to make sure we had data provided for the over 600 women that were in that program, you know? And that data helped them a lot. So it was not a data for them how um, um, for them to only look for information, but for them to also check information on health, for their babies, on nutrition and stuff like that. And so um, the, the inequalities that has existed, um, existed for us in a developing country like the Gambia could have really been breached if cost was down. We have only one submarine cable, all the companies that the ACE, all the companies that took uh, a loan um, towards getting that cable, they are, they are still paying back. And of course, it will make cost high. And we don't have a situation whereby we have community networks. You know, we have not really, even though we have a universal access policy that was developed in 2020, just last year, we have not really initiated it to make it work that we can have all these public community centers, even our, our hospitals, like during the COVID, nurses had to be crying out that they need data. And the data was not forthcoming until some cell um, companies decided, okay, we have to um, um, provide um, data for them. But the plus on that, whereby because cost of mobile phone is cheap, when the government had to do payments to people um, who were really affected, like over, I think was estimated, that in terms of the poverty level, they did the aggregation with our Gambian Bureau of, Public, um, of, of Statistics. I think um, close to over 100,000 people were really poor of the poor, as the government put it, in different neighborhoods. They, were, they transferred most of the monies through um, mobile money. So the two, so mobile money that was not really popular before COVID, even though it was there, it's not, it, we're not like Kenya that in PESA is everywhere. We have um, um, AfriCell money and Kudo from QCell, but they, all of a sudden mobile money became very popular because people were receiving um, monies from government as a palliative to support them in, in, in terms of COVID. And those mobile devices with their phone numbers also helped the government when they were distributing the three basic commodities that um, people use um, um, for their daily living, rice, um, sugar, sugar, and oil. The government was able to use those, um, um, what do you call it, the, the data from the regulatory authority to be able to know where um, people located. So it helped a lot of women. But I think um, I, will stop, I, I will stop by saying that the importance for a developing country to have community networks that will support women is very, very important. Because if you even look at them as um, illiterates, all their children are going to school and their children are the ones teaching their mothers how to um, use this um, mobile phone. I'll, I'll, I'll give a, 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 a simple example that happened during the COVID. For me, there was a lady that used to supply me fish. And during the COVID, she said, okay, the best way, she will speak in the Wolof language, record it on WhatsApp and take the picture of the fish. And then if I say it's okay, she will now give me the price, do voice recording. She can, she, um, she cannot type text and everything. And she used that for several of her customers, you know? So I had to tell her how the angles to take the picture. So on a particular Sunday, I sat with her and everything. And she said, people just um, forwarding her fish to other, um, people increased her customer base. So it, it shows a lot. Most women use social media um, 
And I think if we get them more included, especially in the global south, we can make the world a better place. Looking at the roadmap for digital um, cooperation, which the um, United Nations has done, I think the third one, um, those inequalities are important for us to address vulnerable communities. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And um, I think you highlighted some of the uh, issues about affordability, but also um, how political, political participation for women were impacted in COVID due to uh, this, this lack of affordability. Um, so yeah, that, that, and, and you also spoke about some of the strategies that, that we could think about. Um, Avis, I would like to get your uh, you know, input on what has been the impact of COVID in digital inequalities and social inequalities in in where you in the region that you're working. I said the impact has been two. Everybody has now realized that we have to be connected, and connectivity has become very very important for every family in the Gambia. You know, so um, having a conference call and even um, use of Google Classroom that was only popular in private schools. Public schools are now using it. Um, women are now working together um, to do what you call joint usage of phone with data that they contribute to get information, you know, especially in relation um, to health, education, and agriculture. We now have a lot of startups that have come up that deal with delivery service, you know, so over, overall, um, despite um, the sadness that COVID has brought, um, it has spurred innovation. And, 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 and that is the great thing. Among, among communities that relied on maybe doing things face to face, you know, it has really spurred innovation. And that is the, the plus that will make us, not only in Gambia or any developing country, but the whole world to be resilient in future for any other pandemic that will happen. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, Avis, if you can just uh, share your inputs on this. Thank you very much. So I was saying Abis Momini from working Protege Cuba organization, civil society, based in Yaoundé in Cameroon. So I'm sure the experience we have done in the field during the COVID, COVID pandemic. So regarding Cameroon, uh, Cameroon situation, uh, Cameroon is situated in Central Africa and we have more than 26 million of people about what we have 51% of female population. And we have more than 24% of this population based in rural area. So during the COVID, the, the COVID pandemic, the rural area was much affected as some rural areas was not covered by the national radio, media radio or specifically uh, areas surrounding the borders. Uh, many community telecenter projects implemented we supposed to reduce digital device has stopped functioning. And for the profit reason, private mobile and an internet operators do not want to invest the infrastructure in the rural areas. So as a consequence, some rural area, uh, rural population do not access to government information and internet accessibility related to barrier measure against COVID-19, specifically women and girls. And so what impacted? So even uh, some rural people receive information from national radio or from community radio, most of the rural areas people were not prevented from the sanitation prevention against COVID-19. And so due to lack of information in this rural area, there were a lot of, let's say, a lot of disinformation inside this population. And we observed that the national television learning program who, <coughs> who have been set up has not been issued to boys and girls in these areas. And due to the higher cost of uh, digital tools, citizens and rural population were not, uh, were, not, were not at the same level of information. And we observed that workers 
who constrained to work virtually and at home were not being prepared to test exercise. And it was so hard again for women workers at the, as the family environment was not adapted. And that is the impact we observe. So maybe we will share again, uh, again, challenge and the uh, strategy. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Um, I think we've, we're getting a good idea, uh, an idea of like the different types of uh, ways that the existing social inequalities um, with and its relationship to digital inequalities were affected during COVID. And even some of the strategies that have kind of come up from uh, due to the needs uh, of, of the that the COVID pandemic presented itself. Um, you know, we you, uh, we heard uh, Sadaf talk about the digital strategies on education and Mona spoke about counter narratives, Consulate spoke about innovation. Um, I think it would be helpful to look at what uh, what are the strategies and tools that have been successful in being rights affirming and where uh, what have been the strategies which which haven't been and really like uh, from the perspective of how stakeholders look at digital in inclusion so if you're talking about a strategy that was that's um, government driven or civil society driven or counter narratives that uh, you know are kind of coming up grassroots driven, uh, how, how is digital inclusion really being looked at um, when developing these strategies or tools? And anyone can kind of just... So in terms of, term of strategy from the government, so uh, there were many consultation, to, uh, consultation that took place. Uh, for example, consultation to provide uh, reliable information to national radio and television. We saw the Ministry of Health send sanitation prevention message to people phone. Also, the telecom regulator send prevention message to prevent people against disinformation and the penalty and cure. From the telecom private sector, we observed that most of them reduce the cost of the mobile communication and internet to enable families to communicate at the ship costs and assessing information. From civil societies, some actors develop websites to provide government information and data collection related to the pandemic. So that making people uh, assessing the information and also the, the data news from the World Health Organization. And my, 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 my own organization, uh, we, we provide online talk on the internet security prevention to the community. That is the strategy we adopt. So uh, for the policy, maybe we will come back to the policy approach. Thank you. Sure, sure, thank you. So, you know, I was, I was doing, looking at your question and I find it impossible to answer because strategies, especially when we are dealing with something like gender-based violence, um, everything comes back to context. Um, and I think, you know, in Pakistan, we, we have worked through a number of ways, you know, we have collectivized, which is not a new strategy at all. Um, we have organized online, we have made things visible, we have stayed behind the scenes to, when, you know, to look at different cases. So case by case by case, um, engaging with the corporations, engaging with the government, engaging with allies, engaging with social societies, trying concentration, trying, um, you know, cohesive dialogue, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know, sometimes things work, sometimes things don't work. Um, what I feel the common thread is A, persistence, um, but B, I think what we need to strategize upon um, are ways to kind of bring the agency to women collectives, bring the agency um, to, you know, have the agency somehow, not just over how speech expression experience of the internet um, is governed, but also what's the process through which these governance procedures are made. Um, so I, I was just hearing about, you know, all these discussion about affordability and access, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think one of the key fundamental 
one of the fundamental gaps in how we discuss these narratives is how we imagine the internet. And I know imaginations um, is more philosophy based, but I feel that understanding and then the internet as a utility, as something that's not, you know, optional, a utility like we understand electricity, like we understand the right to electricity or gas or water, etc. Um, and and then find then finding ways to kind of make it gender neutral, make it gender positive. Um, that would help, especially in terms of how we are governing it, how policy is responding to it. So I'll give you an example. Um, I've been made the amicus curiae in a court case that's going on in Pakistan, which deals specifically with um, with content regulation on social media. And as a freedom of expression activist, for a very long time, my stance um, on content regulation, on platform regulation, um, has been pretty straightforward. Given the country we live in, given the aggressive attitudes that we have faced, we have talked against localization. We have talked against, you know, providing government ways to to um, kind of exercise control over how technology and tech, you know, digital discourse is regulated in the country. Um, but as someone who now faces the responsibility of creating a brief that the case would inform its decision by. Um, um, you know, when I come to kind of compare how stances that we usually take from a principal point of view come to play in effect. So for example, no localization, no way to get data when a woman's pictures are leaked um, and no way to hold anybody in accountable because you know um, privacy concerns, a lot of very genuine, very serious, very valid concerns have created an environment where we oppose policies through which an action could be taken. So in the end, I feel that the, you know, the crux of the matter is as a collective, as civil society, as feminist activists, we need to kind of find ways um, where we insert ourselves more prominently and more, um, you know, in a way that's like detrimental to how platform governance works, how platforms respond to um, requests, how platform requests to respond to individual cases of violence in different contexts. I understand the appeal of following global principles and international principles and creating global uh, models of governance and responsibilities, but reality is much more um, complex. What's true in Pakistan may not be true in the US, it may not be true in Palestine, um, and what's true in one case in Pakistan may not be true in the other case. So unless we find a way to create um, an, a, a truly multi-stakeholder model that informs platform governance. Okay, yeah, sorry. So I think as a strategy, I think that's that's a missing link. We try to hold our governments accountable a lot. We try to um, work on policy and governance coming from states a lot. Um, but I think we are not focusing enough on how platforms behave, on how digital corporations behave. Um, and in the end, they hold the key. They are the key to how um, our data will be secured, how our data will be shared, and how hate speech and attacks and violence against us would be tolerated or not tolerated. Um, so I know it doesn't have to do my, this this long winded thing doesn't have to do anything with strategizing, but I think one thing that we do need to strategize on um, is dealing with, you know, having more effective solutions regarding corporate governance, making, finding ways to um, kind of insert private voices, collective voices, feminist voices in how corporate governance is dealt with. Um, I don't know how that would be done, but yeah, I think this is a strategy that we need to start Start making now. Yeah, th thanks for sharing that, Sadaf. Um, yeah, Mona, if you want to yeah. jump in. Yeah, and then thanks, Mallory. Rahini. Thanks, Rohini. I don't want to repeat what <clears throat> Sadaf already talked about. I totally agree that we should think about the multi stakeholders coordination and networking in this field. But there is something that we could build on 
which is what social some of social media uh, companies had started in this regard specifically. For example, Facebook, they have adapted some uh, videos that we for their help center, where we at Hamle were uh, telling women if they have if they are facing any kind of uh, gender based violence <clears throat> to report about that because I'll, I'll be speaking um, now on on our uh, observatory, but I'll continue with the Facebook point at the beginning. So they adapted that video that we provided uh, for the local women uh, in the Palestinian context that they should uh, consult a woman or a feminist organization to talk about uh, their, their, uh, their gender-based violence that they are exposed to and to check how these organizations could help. <clears throat> so Facebook is also developed, has also developed some tools to help women. So if women are being harassed online or, or if there is someone who's pretending to be you on the social media platforms, you could report on that. And social media platforms such as Facebook could take action, could block that account, could, uh, <clears throat> could support you in this case, technically, I'm speaking technically here, but for the psycho support, psycho psychological support it's better to have like a, a woman organization where we in palestine have a, a couple of organizations that are working with with women on that for hamla ourselves we at uh, uh, um in last month, yeah, in, in November, we have launched the first Palestinian Digital Rights Violations Observatory. It's called HUR, uh, where we are documenting all kinds of digital rights violations that Palestinians are exposed to. So we are talking about uh, account censorship, content censorship, uh, smearing campaigns, and any other thing, including the gender-based violence. So in this platform, women can report to us <clears throat> And we are coordinating with other feminist organizations so we can let them know that there is a case here who need a psychosocial, uh, for example, support. But we also take action with the social media platforms as the trusted partner to them. We know that there, there is needed coordination in a higher level, uh, as Sadaf said, in a multi-stakeholders level. But at least we started from here. And I feel that that was helpful, to be honest, since June when women were reporting to us on the on the cases of when their phones were were <coughs> were confiscated by the uh, pa and they were sharing their private pictures and at that time we have reported and we escalated that to the social media platforms to take down these private pictures and we are continuing till now uh like last month there was a smear campaign against a lady from gaza strip we reported that we were able to take down that content that we are dealing like based on context but also case by case till now and that kind of data uh, digitalized observatory is really helping us to manage the situation till we find like a policy solution but to be honest with you a policy solution without uh raising awareness campaigns and without uh, a um, digital let's say um uh, uh, uh raising awareness campaigns for people so people can know what is the gender-based violence? What is the hate speech on the online spaces against women? Uh, what is the surveillance for women? And many other things we can't work, like changing policies without working with the grassroots, with working with the, with the communities. Uh, it won't be efficient because we need to work with the theory of change. We need to tell people where is the real problem so they can adapt their behavior and they can grow up their children with a different mentality so we can protect women in the digital spaces instead of choosing leaving these the, on, the internet and leaving these digital spaces only for males, only for men. So that kind of work that we are doing, it's fruitful till now. We know that there is escalation in hate speech against women, stereotyping women, gender-based violence, and other kind of uh, violations against women in the digital spaces. But at least we, we, we try to find the starting point to work with women in Palestine. But also we are really glad if, if, there is, if there could be any kind of coordination between us to start also working on a different level on that.
Thanks, Mona. Um, yeah, I think you you you're speaking about how there, it's really important to have kind of a grassroots dri driven a, approach that 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 there's awareness um, that that has to come in before we really can get a good strategy and a multi stakeholder uh, approach uh, in place. Um, I think Mallory was uh, also wanted to speak about uh, either one of the earlier points or uh, what Sadaf was saying. Yeah, I wanted to bring a few threads together and um, Mona added perfect perfectly to what I was gonna say in response to Sadaf. So the thing that I think is great about um, what was, what's was what been said is like, is um, sort of intersectional feminists working online in this internet space, we actually want it all. Um, that's something that the feminist principles of the internet really talk about a lot, which is that, you know, we don't, we're not going to choose between um, these false dichotomies anymore. You know, we want local access and um, recourse to harms. At the same time, we don't want localized content moderation tools. That it, we don't have to choose one or the other. Um, and I think we should always continue to remember that we don't have to and that we should ask for what we want and we, our position should be complicated. It's okay to have a complicated position. We want to have you know, user empowered reporting so that we don't see unwanted you know, explicit imagery. At the same time, we want to be able to post our own explicit imagery without censorship. That's a perfectly acceptable position. They're not in opposition to one another. Um, and then to that end, you know, I think that uh, another false dichotomy I think that um, we're often caught in is the online versus offline. This is starting to come into more stark relief. Um, and I'll just explain what I mean. You know, we started this conversation by talking about the like digital inclusion. And I love, I always talk about this APC report on um, the sort of double exclusion that happens with, with um, you know, difference in access levels. On the first hand, you're excluded because you don't have access to the internet, yes. But then it's a double exclusion because the prior analog real life world that you once were able to engage in is rapidly disappearing and becoming digitized. So you're doubly disenfranchised. You don't have access to um, real people that are accountable and that you can talk to if you need to apply for a driver's license. Um, and then you also can't do it because you don't have access to the internet to apply for your driver's license, right? So um, I think that the trend is also becoming, you know, this right to a world that isn't connected um, as well. I think there's, um, I mean, this is expressed, I think there's a, a proposed law on the right to disconnect in the pandemic where as workers, we are constantly at work because our workplace is now our home and we don't always necessarily want to be connected. And so there's a worker's labor right to, to be able to disconnect. That concept is coming up. But I think for, um, for gender lens or for an inclusion lens, we need to hold on to a world that is, um, maybe enhanced by connectivity, but not replaced by it. And that I think is critical to ensure that we have continual inclusion and accessibility of um, daily life for everyone. We shouldn't have to be online to live our lives, right? Um, and, that's, and that's a complicated position, but it's okay to take that complicated position. And then I think the other thing that um, Mona was just talking about, which is that what maybe filling that gap means that we have more organizations. And this is also something that Staff said as well. It, the, another theme there is then what are the organizations, what are the social structures, what are the civil society mechanisms that we um, create and strengthen to fill that gap? Um, and I just want to recognize that we are, that is the cost of digitization. There's a sort of narrative out there that um, digitizing um, the provision of government services or things like that saves money in the long run. It, it doesn't, that cost just gets displaced. And there are now um, community organizations and um, other folks that have to fill that gap and it takes time and it takes resources and it should also gain access and power to the platforms or the agencies that are responsible for running these services. And many times um, we are just met with silence. There's no one to talk to, there's no one to go to. Um, and that's then the role of community services. And I think another then trend we can imagine is that in, um, 
you know, maybe a previous to the internet world, uh, you know, we'd ha there would be, of course, um, services that are there to help with language barriers or literacy barriers, you know, you need support in, um, you know, applying to university or a variety of other things. Um, those, I think, still exist. They just now exist in the form of, you know, cyber cafes and women's rights organizations that are giving training on how to be safe on your cell phone and things like that. It's just we've now sort of rolled into um, these sorts of community-based structures um, more digital aspects so digital security training um you know literacy access to the internet and all of that and that's not necessarily a bad thing i think i just think we need to recognize that um as a really really important function that civil society needs to get better at providing but then also as you've all said and others have said um, making the case that these structures are not informal they should actually be given access to influence the way the platforms work. Um, it isn't just in users. There are structures before that as well. There are um, organizations that are there to speak on behalf of the users, on behalf of the public interest, and on behalf of um, folks who are traditionally excluded from these kinds of spaces. Thanks, Mallory. That, I mean, that's so uh, really like, you made some really excellent points um, and I saw all of the other panelists kind of nodding along, agreeing to what you were saying. Um, so, I mean, if I can kind of say that there's a common understanding, um, you know, as, as Mallory said, that there, that our position can be complicated, that um, there, there are various uh, uh, strategies and stakeholders and really understanding the contextualization that's necessary to create a strategy that really looks at digital inclusion and is able to be effectively uh, digitally inclusive. So if I can take a step back, then if we think about various other stakeholders who are involved in policy making, um, is, is it that there are singular understandings? Um, is it that they, these false dichotomies uh, are taken as uh, as actual dichotomies and and is that where there is uh the the barrier to to inclusivity um and if so how can that change uh would that be through community based structures or some of the strategies that you suggested um yeah if so i i think i want to we're speaking about the civil society perspective um and when in policy making, there are various other st stakeholders. So kind of understanding where, how they approach it and what could be changed in that. If anyone wants to speak to that. Any of the panelists, Avis? Yeah. Thank you. Uh Let's say uh, about policy approach to digital inclusion. In terms of policy approach, we suggest that uh, th there is the necessity for civil society to advocate for national geographic coverage of telecom infrastructure. And also to advocate for the revised law on freedom of to assembly and association, taking in account digital aspect. And we also, uh, emphasize of advocating for the respect and implementation of African Declaration on internet rights and freedoms at national level in African countries. And lastly, advocating for digital bill, because we, we think that uh, by adopting digital bill that give enforcement to the use of uh, ICT to enable sustainable development goal. That's what uh, the approach about uh, what I see we suggest. Thank you. For, for me, um, I will want to look at it from a local content perspective. I think um, we have to put things into context that one rule doesn't apply to all in terms of digital inclusion. We have to be able to create programs that are grassroots oriented to get our, because most of our women, most of our girls, 
more and more they are getting online every day. But there's one thing, most of the content they consume has nothing to do with their local environment. And I think when I, when I, look, at, when I look at the Gambia, for example, this is um, one of the shortcomings we have had. Even though you have high illiteracy rates among women, especially at the grassroots level, we have not m made use of technology in terms of, okay, in all over Africa, it's either you are French speaking or you are um, um, English speaking or you are um, Portuguese speaking. And um, those, um, that's the reality of our life. We have these um, languages and the, the internet is dominated by them. So why don't we use a, a, enough of um, voice messaging to transmit um, information um, um, to um, people so that they will be able to know about their health, their education, and uh, general things that will improve lives. Because at the end of the day, if the internet, its main role is, is, is a tool for empowerment. And we, we have seen how um, a lot of things have happened in this um, since March last year um, um, due to COVID, but a lot of women are still excluded you know, from, from this because of this notion or that they are illiterate and the information that comes out there are all written, you know, and for me in my continent, I think we have failed to create enough content in voice to be able to address that. And I think that is very, very important, how we generate content and relevant content and how we pass out those content on the media. When we had um, the COVID vaccines were coming to Africa, a lot of people had a lot of misinformation. So like in the Gambia, we had cases whereby whole tons of vaccines went to waste because people, but how was the information being passed? You know, did, was, 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 the, was the, it was only um, mostly in English, going to a website and, and, and stuff like that. There was, nothing in, there was nothing in voice. No community did anything that was sending voice messages through. Most of one thing, we know in our continent, not only in Gambia and anywhere in Africa, is that women, they have very strong collective groups. And those collective groups, we have not really used them very well and used digital means to get to them, whereby we can transmit messages through just even a, a WhatsApp voice message. This is what you should what you should do. This is where you can get um, 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 vaccinated, the importance of vaccination, all in the local language. So that local content aspect, we have really filled. And uh, I hope that the educated as, um, among um, women in Africa will take this up to be able to, because they are the ones that can address this better than us, the men. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, sorry, Sadaf, please go ahead. Just like adding to that, I think it's essential, the local content. I think it kind of connects to people's ability to use the internet and for meaningful connectivity, you know, it, it goes beyond excess. And um, whether it's language, whether it's tone and what, whether it's format within which that content is produced and, you know, the ability to, to access that content is created. I think they all come together um, to create, uh, you know, inclusivity or to encourage inclusivity online. Um, I was thinking, um, you know, I think this actually also speaks to one of the challenges that, you know, you, you phrased your question earlier about strategies and, you know, some challenges that are posed to those strategies. And I feel at least in my context, one of the ma major challenges when that kind of hamper the progress that strong women collectives can make is their inability to be intersectional in that way. It's much more easier to rely on the resources that are already available online. It's much easier um, to write in English. It's much easier to use tools um, that are, you know, that are catchy, that will get you engagement. Um, but it's much more difficult to create content that's accessible to women who are outside that circle um, and I do feel that we even as activists sometimes end up creating when we end, when we do create content that speaks to them um, we create it in our own voices it's 
it, it's, it's kind of actually speaking to them rather than us trying to include them. So it's, it becomes a lot of work and it's not, um, you know, it is difficult. It's, it's very difficult as collectives who are supposed to kind of bring together all these intersectionalities, um, not just because it's a lot of work, but, but also often because some of the intersectionalities might be criminalized. So, you know, in a lot of countries, sexual um, minorities are criminalized, their existence is criminalized. And yet this is the question we come back to again and again, especially on Women's Day in Pakistan, a lot of us get out, demonstrate, face threats, respond to it, but then we get asked, do you publicly raise your voice for people who are whose existence is criminalized, um, whose identity is criminalized in the country? And we kind of try and rationalize, you know, oh, but if we did that, we will not get the NOC. If we do that, we will not be able to out on streets. A lot more people will be hampered. So I feel that weaving intersectionality is difficult in physical spaces and it's much more difficult in digital spaces because again, we are being directed by tech, we are being directed by design, by hardware, by algorithms that are made to speak to a majority. And within that, taking a, an, a real feminist approach that's intersectional in terms of content, in terms of creating, enabling access to content, it's something that's just really difficult and challenging. And yeah, if, if anybody has examples on how they successfully navigated it, that, that would be lovely to hear. Yeah, if, if someone wants to speak to that or um, just we have about, I think, eight minutes left. If any of the uh, participants or panelists have any questions for each other um, or just want to share some like last uh, points about, you know, thinking about what are the key factors that we need to think about um, when moving forward. But if there are any participant questions or any panelist questions for each other, please, uh, we'd love to have some cross uh, cross conversations as well. I will come. I will start with um, us to focus on uh, in my last comments on the eight key areas um, for action within this um, roadmap on digital cooperation. I think we should try to embed it um, through our national and regional IGF initiatives. I think in our various community organizations, they are very important because they definitely address everything we are discussing today. And as it's, it's much as possible, we should try to localize the content so that it can get to as much people as possible. That will be um, my closing statement. Thank you all. I just wanted to lift up what Sadaf just said about the positive framing around how to make content more accessible um, to folks who are traditionally excluded, but specifically from a gendered lens. I would, I would really like to start asking that question. I suspect there's been quite a bit of writing about it, but from uh, as a as a technical person, I find that question um, really engaging because there are proposals out there. Um, to optimize the internet, to make it censorship resistant and all those things. And I think in all those efforts, it tends to center the intermediary. It tends to center the needs of the content delivery network or the, you know, and instead of actually the question is the end point um, and maybe not even at the end point as the device, it's the end point as the user of the device. And that even prevent, presents um, an even more engaging issue from the perspective of, you know, say group use or sharing of, you know, devices that are not necessarily owned by one person only. So I'd love to follow that up. And just something that I, I'm, um, I said before um, that I'm trying to remember now, <laughs> sorry, I forgot. Um, oh yes, that more, um, I'd love to see the dynamic coalition grow and also, um, go out with its work, like its scorecard work and its other um, initiatives to other tangential internet governance bodies that are grappling with this issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion as a model, or at least at the very least, just a place where their work can also land and come to. I'm thinking of something called the 
um, inclusive naming initiative. Um, there are a few things out there that they're probably not aware that this dynamic coalition exists or that the IGF itself is free to participate in. Um, it has intercessional work. And so I'd love to look at efforts in which we could um, do a bit more outreach together. Thanks for that, Mallory. And any last thoughts from the other participants? Uh, sorry, the other panelists. Um, no, I guess not. So, I mean, I just want to thank the panelists for this really fruitful discussion. Um, I think there was a lot to cover because we're trying to understand, I mean, from a regional perspective, everyone comes from different region, their work is informed from that context to understand how social inequalities um, and digital inequalities, uh, you know, impact, what are the interlinkages and uh, how COVID impacted that. From that understanding to get to a stage where we're talking about, okay, when we're thinking about strategies um, for digital inclusion and the various stakeholders, what are the various factors that we need to think of and what strategies may be successful for what stakeholders? I mean, there's just really a lot to cover. Um, but I, I think we, the last few points that were discussed were really crucial. Um, and I think we covered a lot. So I just wanted to thank all the panelists for their very fruitful uh, uh, input and to all the participants who joined in. <laughs>